Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the event jointly organized by uh, the American Studies Research Institute at the National University of Public Service and the Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade. This is Tomás Baranyi, Deputy Director for this latter institution. And uh, I'm really happy to announce this uh, very first cooperation between uh, the two institutions. I think uh, there will be but more in the future, and we are looking forward to it. Uh, this very event we found very timely to, to organize uh, in order to assess the first 100 days of uh, this new American presidency and try to sketch up um, something uh, of, a, of a prospect in the future about the same administration. And uh, we'll also take a look at uh, what is um, the analytical value of the first 100 days, uh, but that's just an extra. Let me um, introduce my colleague um, with whom we jointly organize this event. This is Balázs Mártonfi. He's a colorful and you know, already very rich career, uh, contains you know, early positions in the Hungarian public service, and also um, in a broad period of study in the United States, <clears throat> including uh, the receiving of uh, his PhD degree from the American University in 2019, receiving for his PhD dissertation the John McCain Prize, the Munich Security Conference, and uh, also he is now the director of uh, the American Studies Research Institute at the National University of Public Service. Uh, this was my honor to open this event, but now uh, I have no more role here just to give the floor to you. Balaj, again, thank you very much for, for taking the bulk of the organizational issues uh, for this event. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tomas, and thank you for that very uh, generous introduction. And I also look forward to a number of events as we go forward, um, hopefully co-organized by the Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade and by the American Studies Research Institute here at the National University of Public Service. Before we get to the main part of the show, as a housekeeping item, could I please ask that non-panelists um, turn their cameras off so we have a better view of um, who's speaking and who isn't, and that would be very helpful. And in that way, we can start right off. The game plan for today is um, a moderated panel discussion, an esteemed panel who I will introduce shortly. Um, the, the chat, as you may have noticed, is currently turned off. What we will do is proceed through the moderated panel discussion which will involve sort of an assessment of the 100 days by each of our distinguished panelists, and then um, a prognosis for what we think the Biden administration's future policy preferences may be, foreign policy, domestic politics, and all those different priorities. And then at the end, we will also have an open Q&A for um, any of you who have questions, and then I will ask you to um, do that in the chat. So just as a reminder, please turn your cameras off if you're not um, a panelist, unfortunately, technical requirements assist us over there. All right, so let me start by um, introducing the panel for today. Um, our co-organizer, Tomasz Baranyi, a historian, expert on foreign relations, doctorate from Utrecht Lorand University here in Budapest. He was the head of research at the Antal Josef Knowledge Center, and now he's the deputy director for strategy at the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. A man who needs no introduction, and I'm just going in order in the way my screen shows the individuals on camera, so I apologize if this is not quite protocol. Uh, a man who needs no introduction, Tomasz Felegi, former Minister of National Development, rich, colorful CV, but a couple of US-related events, PhD at the University of Connecticut, IREX Fellow at Harvard, and too many accomplishments to list, currently the Director Emeritus of the American Studies Research Institute, and Chief Executive of Euro Atlantic Consulting. Dwight Nystrom, who I, for some reason, don't see on the camera, but he will be here with us. He is a, um, ah, there we go, hi Dwight, all right. He's an affiliate senior scholar here with the American Studies Research Institute, has two decades long experience in the US Foreign Service and the State Department, including assignments to Moscow, Tbilisi, Kabul, and Brasilia, so very colorful over there. Prior to joining the State Department, he was an assistant professor at Montana State University and also taught at the University of Louisville. I think that's how I pronounce it properly, Louisville. PhD in economics from Auburn. 
Excellent. Then we have Ryan Brockhaus, who is a senior fellow with the Hungary Foundation based in Washington, DC, is a contributor here at the Ludovica University of Public Service, uh, completing a graduate degree at Arizona State University and researching here for this year on US-Hungarian defense cooperations. And last but not least, Mate Litke, who's an engineer in environmental management. He was the di he's currently the director of the Climate Policy Institute at the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, where he worked as a policy analyst prior to that for a number of years. So that's the panel. Um, I think we'll hear excellent thoughts and I'll be the moderator. But what we did not plan, and again, just a kind reminder, if you're not a panelist, please turn your um, camera off. Um, what we did not plan for was Biden's speech last night when we were setting up this event. We knew the 100 days were coming. This is the 100th day in office. And we knew that this would be a great time to sort of look at U.S. and Hungarian relations, but broadly speaking, the foreign policy agenda of um, Biden and his domestic policy. But last night he made a, uh, a little over an hour long speech. It wasn't quite the State of the Union, but let's just call it the quasi State of the Union, made a number of interesting points. As the moderator, unfortunately, it uh, fell on me to make sort of macro level thought, thematic thoughts that I took away from that um, speech, and then we'll proceed on to the panel itself. I think one of the challenges that that um, I took away from the speech last night was a thought that or a question that thinks comes to my mind when I think about Biden's road ahead is whether it's prudent for Washington to conflate um, the China challenge with the democracy challenge, roughly speaking. And we'll hear from um, Tomasz Barani about what this means and how we can go forward to it. The second, the second theme or larger question that came to my mind as I listened to it and I listened to um, pundits, politicians and policy practitioners responding to it was a broader question of the state of US politics, polarization, and specifically um, bipartisanship. We know polarization is not new, it happens. Um, it's an ongoing process, it's at magnified levels now, and usually bipartisanship was the way to sort of calm the nerves, if you will, of the US political institution system. And as I listened to some of the comments on, on what Biden's speech meant and how far off the two parties responses were, I couldn't help but think um, whether bipartisanship still means the same thing as it did early on. And if we have the time at the end, um, I'll come back to thoughts on this. But without further ado, I want to start us off with Tomasz Boronyi, who will get the first question on Tomasz. Broadly speaking, on foreign policy, how successful would you assess Biden's first 100 days, specifically some of the key achievements, maybe failures, and some of the noticeable absences that you thought should have happened and weren't there? Okay, um, very simple question. Uh, no, just kidding, um, a pretty complicated one. Uh, first, uh, we have not much material um, as for foreign policy yet. There were <clears throat> just a limited number of you know, very significant uh, foreign policy events. Do, um, there, have, there has been a few and um, maybe we can guess you know the overall direction of american foreign policy in uh, in the coming the coming uh, months and coming years so i think i uh, try to grab those significant events and uh, try to try to assess them as successes or, or more like failures and also some noticeable absences i really i really like your term here noticeable absences um okay um i think um there is um, there are a set of uh, you know pronounced political goals uh, by the Biden administration. Um, one of them was uh, you know, a renewed commitment to human rights and democracy promotion, but also something uh, that we may call the great power competition uh, that is uh, that shows a large degree of continuity with the Trump administration. Uh, I think um, you know maybe uh, the most noticeable events connect to this uh, great power competition, whether it be China or uh, Russia. Uh, I think uh, here there was a surprise for for the political analyst uh, community because uh, most of the people actually expected something of a reset, like 
each and every American administration began with the reset with Russia. Uh, and they, there was also an expectation that, you know, the harsh anti-China rhetoric of uh, President Trump um, would give way to, you know, more diplomatic um, uh, language, at least uh, in this direction. And, you know, the um, the outcome of this letter was the Anchorage summit, uh, which, at which, you know, the rhetoric was uh, was uh, was quite undiplomatic, to, to, to say the least. Uh, I think that's one point that we can grab uh, for for making prospects, but that's that will be the next round of questions. Uh, I am again, democracy promotion and human rights agenda is also high on the top. Um, last time there was this very noticeable act of, you know, recognizing the Armenian genocide uh, within the Ottoman Empire and the First World War, but also there was the publication of uh, the report on the murder of uh, Khashoggi, uh, the Saudi journalist. Um, this is uh, often heralded as, as you know, as a, as a very different outlook, a very moral outlook on, on, on foreign policy. Uh, but what I sense here is a little bit of contradiction with, with yet another pronounced goal, and that's the that's the renewal of traditional U.S. alliances, um, including those in the Middle East, those in the Indo-Pacific, and also uh, the one in Europe. Um, because, uh, and I think that, that that will be, you know, a very problematic point: how to how to renew and strengthen an alliance when uh, when there is a there is a constant assessing of uh, of your partners uh, based on um, you know, democracy uh, promotion and uh, and human rights issues. So that will be something very very difficult to to fine tune. Um, and I think there's there are already signs that this will be difficult. Uh, what else happened? Uh, the, the first visit uh, by the new American Foreign uh, State Secretary, uh, Anthony Blinken, was made to Indo-Pacific partners like Korea, Japan, Australia, but also he visited uh, European allies like two times. There was even an instance when uh, he spoke with uh, V4 foreign ministers and it was reported to be a very constructive consultation. Um, and this is a very good sign that uh, the United States is uh, showing this commitment, uh, for instance, to NATO and European defense as something, uh, you know, very positive and very solid to, to, to build on. And I think that's uh, probably from a European perspective, uh, one of the one of the very positive steps the Biden administration has already taken. Um, you know, the, the instant rejoining to the Paris Peace Accords uh, is also very noticeable. Climate change uh, will be very high on the agenda, and I think this is a point where the Biden administration also scored some major victories with involving China and some of the major uh, polluters uh, in in an international regime to combat climate change. I think that was an unexpected uh, an unexpected victory. Uh, but also there are some more controversial uh, issues, um, you know, uh, restarting the negotiations or making steps towards you know, restarting negotiations uh, about the GCPOA is rather lopsided. I, 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 uh, I wouldn't call it a success, at least not at this point. And also it was very controversial to announce the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan uh, by, uh, by September 11 this year. Uh, and it is especially um, you know, concerning as the security situation uh, is deteriorating constantly in this country. Like, I mean, it was, you know, it has a very bad optic that uh, they say that they withdrew troops from Afghanistan because, you know, the situ security situation allows. And then uh, they ask some of the embassy members to, to, to get out of Afghanistan if they can do distant working because the security situation is worsening. Um, so uh, that's again, uh, that shows, uh, I would say, um, a very complicated relation with with interventionism. I think uh, it shows that the Biden administration has a different outlook. They would uh, not resort to intervention only in uh, as a last resort. That's uh, very very visible, and also that uh, the American public uh, is now fed up with uh, with you know foreign um, you know military interventions, uh, and this is something that has I think a domestic. Uh, 
context. Uh, that's but, the perfect segue. I'm asking, sorry? That's quite all right. That's the perfect segue to our next question. Yep. I want to leave some ammunition for you for your next uh, next question, specifically on domestic politics, as um, time is already flying. But those are very, very interesting thoughts on um, specifically on the Afghanistan withdrawal, which we'll, we'll talk about with Ryan as well, sort of the conditions based versus timetable based, how you sell that to the domestic public versus your allies. So um, I think many U.S. presidents wanted to end the war. We know that, but only one will be able to do that. But let's turn to domestic politics um, with Dwight over here. So sort of the same question to you on domestic politics or domestic policy issues. How do you assess the first 100 days on uh, of, of Biden? Some of the cabinet picks, the gun control issue, the refugee crisis, numerous different things um, that could be mentioned. Interestingly, the refugee crisis was sort of noticeably absent from yeah. um, last week, last night's speech. And sort of the, the broader angle I would like you to touch upon is are the two parties still speaking the same language? A recent study, for example, shows that over 80 percent of Democrats think that the United States is a racist country, whatever that may mean. But only 30 percent of Republicans responded in the affirmative when asked the same question. So obviously the Republican answer sort of explains to us why the response to um, <coughs> Biden was was that it is sort of so domestic politics. Take it away, Dwight. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. First of all, let me thank the Institute of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade and the American Studies Research in Institute for inviting me to speak here. Um, and I think the answer to your question about how successful has Biden been the first 100 days is we'll see. Um, I, you know, given the way that the U.S. legislative process moves, um, 100 days is really too hard to assess. Um, how far along uh, 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 Biden has uh, has come. I do think, though, that a lot of people were surprised with the sort of large uh, spending packages that he introduced pretty rapidly. Um, and so I'd really like to start talking about those uh, first, um, if you don't mind. Um, just to give you a little perspective on how big those are, uh, it's a total, there are three of them, and it's a $6 trillion price tag as of right now. It probably is not going to end up there, um, but it's it's significant. So it's about 30% of total U.S. GDP uh, in 2019. So it's a, it's a significant amount of money, a new spending that's coming out of Washington. Um, I think the first one was the COVID-related stimulus. Uh, that was not really contentious at all. Um, because that had been done before. And, you know, so it, it passed relatively easily. There are two more that, that are out there right now. There's a $2.3 trillion American jobs plan, which is aimed at improving infrastructure, uh, ostensibly. Um, although Republicans are opposing it um, on really two counts. And these are traditional sort of Republican um, ideas is that well, one of them is. One of them is they they see the, the they're going to pay for this through higher corporate tax rates, higher rates on individuals, uh, higher capital gains tax rates, and then, then the other thing too is that they point out that um, some of this is not actually infrastructure spending as as it's usually uh, defined. Uh, for example, there's 400 billion dollars, about 16 percent of this, that's going to go to expand long-term home and community pays care services. And, and basically it's a transfer to Medicaid, um, which is gonna be uh, you know, something that's that's uh, gonna be uh, uh, talked about by, by Republicans. Um, I think there's room to negotiate, it's, at least it seems to me. Uh, the Republicans really do, if they wanna be in the room for these negotiations, they really gotta put some, some alternative plan together. There have been questions about that. Um, I think, you know, and when I say recently announced the third one, the recently announced $1.8 trillion American family spent was announced like two days ago. Um, and then he talked about it in his, his speech last night. Um, you know, this is a lot of things for uh, child tax credits, child care subsidies. It's about the Democrats are calling it sort of the CARE Act, um, building an infrastructure for the family. Um, and I think that, you know, the early days in this, there's not a lot of specificity on what's going to happen with that. There's not a lot of specificity on this uh, $2.3 trillion American jobs plan either. So I think, you know, I mean, um, you know, one strand of opposition to these initiatives is something I'm going to quote this because I want to get it right. 
uh, was something that Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said. He said he called the plan, quote unquote, another Trojan horse for far left demands. And I think, and this gets to your question, which I'll get to in a second here, about are Republicans and Democrats talking the same language, right? Um, and then the other the other question is, is Republicans point out, you know, the economy was already expanding uh, third quarter and fourth quarter last year. So do we need all of this stimulus? And I won't go into the numbers because that'll take too long. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, in, in answer to your question, or at least my opinion on this is that, no, I don't think I don't think Republicans and Democrats are, are talking the same, same language. And I think, you know, you talk to the average American and I know a lot of them. Um, uh, they're pretty reasonable by and large. It's sort of like, but the problem I think, and I, I don't mean to, you know, get on the media harping, but but I think part of it is, you know, all the information out there. <clears throat> uh, it's almost who can shout the loudest. Um, but if you sit down with your average, you know. American who's politically savvy in any way, they recognize that there's going to have to be compromise. But there, we have a hard time having that conversation nowadays. Um, and that's, you're, you pointed it out, this is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on since at least the 90s. Um, and, you know, with Gingrich and, and going after Clinton and Clinton back at Gingrich and all that. So um, I don't think that's a new phenomenon. Um, a couple more things, if I have the time. I think I got a little bit of time here. Uh, I think the immigration issue, the border and immigration, is really Biden's Achilles heel. Um, the Republicans have already said they're going to run on that in the midterm elections in 2022, um, and I think that you know they he, they have to come up with some sort of coherent policy. To date, they've done certain things that they promised, um, but nothing that has stemmed the tide. I mean, you still see. Uh, minors crossing the border and, and having to find shelter and stay at shelter. Um, gun control, again, very contentious issue. Uh, hard to get anything through the Senate at this point. They've done some, you know, initiatives tasking the Justice Department to, you know, close some loopholes in, in some of the, the gun, gun legis regulations, I should say. Um, and they're pushing for tighter background checks, which, I mean, again, Americans on both sides, if you really talk to them, they're they're OK with this. I mean, I think that you should have um, some ID, some way to check whether or not somebody has a a, um, a criminal background before you sell them a gun. And there are cases uh, of that. Um, but and again, a lot of this is each state has a different way of looking at it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it right there because I think I'm at my limit. I checked my my phone here, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Perfect answer. Perfect on time as well. And very interesting thoughts over there. Yeah, I think one of the key questions as we go, go forward, other than sort of, you know, does D.C. become the 51st state, um, packing the court or all that different questions on when does this start and where does this end, is the question of the filibuster. And yeah. Which, which we can talk about it in the next round of questions. But turning our eyes back onto um, Europe and the Budapest view, if I may, from the view of the Danube, um, Tomasz Felegi, I'd like to ask you about U.S.-Hungarian relations. We've heard sort of the Biden administration's initial foreign policy steps, initial domestic politics, domestic policy steps, but I'd like to give you the floor so that you can provide us with a general view of how you would assess U.S.-Hungarian relations in the under the Trump administration, so we have some sort of um, conversation piece starter. And then after the hundredth day, which is today, how do you think U.S. and relations are generally speaking under the Biden administration? Um, Tomas, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I also am um, very honored to be here and uh, be a panelist uh, for this uh, for this meeting. Uh, well, uh, the one hundred days, it's a myth. Certainly, as the uh, as the title of this event uh, says, and uh, one of the uh, functions of uh, for analysts, actually, otherwise, uh, 100 days doesn't make any sense. By the way, in my view, uh, as a concept, uh, it's a statement. Fundamentally, uh, it can be used as a statement. It can be uh, used to judge the first impression, as we normally say. How many times can you make a first impression? Only once. And that's the uh, real role of the 100 days. And uh, judging from this perspective, it is uh, hardly uh, any 
meaningful thing that would uh, that would give us any real uh, direction how U.S.-Hungarian relations will develop based on the first 100 days. Uh, certainly, there is a history. There is a history of the past 10 years, uh, and we see, you know, uh, basically uh, many uh, people who are in the new government uh, spend some time uh, in uh, two of the Obama administrations. So it can be very much expected to uh, to have some kind of continuity going back to the uh, to the Obama administrations in terms of uh, foreign policy approach towards Europe or uh, or Hungary uh, for that matter. And uh, as, uh, as Tomasz uh, Baranyi uh, pointed out, uh, the uh, the role of human rights in the in the new administration's foreign policy, maybe some of the uh, the the blankets or uh, or some of the actual issues that may define uh, in many ways, the uh, Hungarian-U.S. Uh, relations, as, as, is, as it happened in the past, uh, certainly. So, uh, one other aspect that I would uh, I would uh, emphasize as a as a point which uh, remains to be seen how it will develop is uh, how and to which direction uh, the U.S. will move from uh, uh, from as we called it in the in the past transactional foreign policy towards a more activist uh, foreign policy, which uh, I think uh, the way human rights is used and connected with uh, with uh, uh, national security interests may have a, a clear indication what sort of uh, of arguments, what sort of directions we will see and hear in the next couple of uh, months, years. Uh, concerning uh, uh, concerning issues of uh, democracy deficit, uh, and uh, again, which is uh, going back uh, uh, to the past couple of uh, of uh, like 15 years or so uh, in uh, in U.S. Hungarian uh, discussions. So, uh, from a uh, political point of view, uh, I think uh, uh, what is uh, what is clear, and I think there is another clear indication, which is, uh, which I think relates to um, to the to the current situation and to the new administration, but not to the to yesterday's speech, and that is the the uh, the publication by Freedom House and the um, and CSIS a, a week ago uh, on the uh, uh, the document task force on uh, on supporting democracy and and countering uh, authoritarianism in the world. And it's basically an action plan with seven major points, and uh, it's really uh, uh, setting the tone and the directions of uh, human rights based foreign policy, uh, which is again, in my view, a return to the to the uh, to the foreign policy era of um, of, of the Obama administrations uh, with all the differences uh, with different people and different circumstances, certainly uh, uh, after the uh, the four years of the Trump, Trump administration, there has to be some kind of continuity in foreign policy, including uh, including the Hungarian-US relations as well. So, uh, and the other aspect was also Tomasz already pointed out, so uh, it's just a, a second uh, role uh, that remained uh, for me here is the, uh, is the, uh, is the different difference in emphasis on Russia and China and returning to, uh, to a more um, confrontational um, relationship with Russia, uh, including the Ukrainian question, and uh, uh, may lead to, uh, to issues that may come up with a, a stronger view and stronger voice, like the uh, 5G network issue vis-a-vis -vis China, Huawei, uh, and national security interests and Hungarian policy. So when it comes to uh, to very uh, uh, detailed points in uh, in military security cooperation, economic cooperation, and political issues, we may see three different uh, layers, three different uh, aspects with different um, results. So it is uh, what I'm just concluding, uh, and my time is up. Uh, I think uh, the first 100 days uh, uh, don't give us any any real indication 
what sort of pragmatic views the United States will take uh, vis-a-vis Hungary. Uh, the more pragmatic, the better chances we have to, uh, to have a, a meaningful uh, political relationship. I don't think that uh, economic relations are, are, are really subject to, uh, to, to these political developments. It's a different trajectory. Uh, business relations are flourishing and that certainly every, at every given moment, business relations can be better than they are. Uh, the point is that it's good enough and it will develop. I'm, I'm sure that uh, both countries and especially the private sectors of, uh, of both countries have a clear interest to, uh, to improve even more economic relations. And I know that there is a very strong uh, uh, Hungarian uh, wish to do that and, uh, and developing even with the involvement of, uh, of government uh, forces and, and government initiatives. Well, thank you very much. That was a comprehensive answer. You mentioned a number of times that um, even though the 100 days is a myth, it's useful for signaling, messaging, demonstrating political will and priorities. You also spoke about how we could potentially see, although that's not quite the way you phrased it, a return to an Obama third term or an Obama three administration. Um, That's an interesting question. And I think I'll ask Ryan um, whether the Obama administration's first 100 days were indicative of their later four years and were the Trump administration's first 100 days. So how much of a myth is this really about or how much can we talk about political will and priorities? But before I give the floor to Ryan, might I kindly ask all our guests who are not panelists to turn their cameras off? There are different versions of the MS Teams links going on. I'm not quite sure what it is, but if you're not a panelist, please um, turn your uh, camera off. And with that, Ryan, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Thank you for having me too. Uh, Well, with all things politics, uh, that is kind of a rather complicated question. My answer would be yes, but. Uh, If you were to measure the first 100 days as merely a representation, of let's say a new administration's policy priorities for the duration of their tenure, then uh, yes. I mean, most of the time I would say in most cases, uh, the first hundred days is a good barometer more or less. However, uh, the success or failure of the first hundred days for a president is uh, in my belief, often at the mercy of outside forces, two in particular. Uh, One would be the general state of America at the point in time that that president enters office. Uh, Is it in crisis? For example, uh, you know, with with Biden in office right now, we have the global pandemic. In the case of Obama, sort of a a certain uh, or similar issue happened as well. We were in the midst of a global financial crisis. Uh, The Great Recession was upon us in 2009. So that kind of allowed. Obama a sort of a mandate to push these big policies in the first 100 days. And that ultimately culminated in the American Recovery and Investment Act in uh, the early phases of 2009. At the time, and I know Dwight mentioned earlier, these uh, stimulus packages that are being presented now, these are massive. But at the time in 2019, this America Recovery and Investment Act was uh, greater than $800 billion rescue package. And at that time was unprecedented. Uh, This included uh, government programs, jobs programs, infrastructure spending, and then also a push into green and renewable uh, energy as well. That was unprecedented, sort of a progressive move, if you will. And that sort of paved the way into other progressive legislation that was pushed in that 100 days of Obama's tenure. Uh, Another example is the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act that was passed very shortly after uh, the stimulus. And that was to essentially raise the statute of limitations for females who uh, wanted to essentially sue employers uh, for unfair pay, unfair pay practices uh, compared to their uh, male contemporaries. So again, it, it is an opportunity for a new administration to sort of push and pave the way for their agenda. Um, In the case of Trump, it was a little bit different. The situation was different in 2016 and 2017. There was no global financial crisis, although the economy was slowing down, uh, especially in the last year of the Obama administration. They were approaching almost zero growth. 
but it was more about undoing the previous administration and the progressive policies of the Obama administration. What Trump ran into was, in many ways, uh, his attitude and his uh, combative personality, which really turned a lot of politicians on the left especially, but even on the right as well, off, which made it more difficult for him to pass legislation through a legislative process. So if we look statistically speaking, in 2009, Obama uh, made 19 executive orders uh, in the first 100 days. It was 33 for Trump in 2017. So he had to use the executive orders to kind of push through his policies. Uh, and we saw that with uh, the approval of the Keystone XL pipeline, the Dakota Access pipeline, uh, limiting the amount of regulations to uh, shale oil and fracking. Uh, those were big events that was unable to uh, get pushed through in the legislative process and had to use executive actions with regards to that. Uh, additionally, the main goal for the Trump administration, his main platform in 2016 and 17, was the repeal and replacement of Obamacare. That was tried in the first 100 days, and unfortunately, that failed. Uh, and again, I think that goes more to the relationship that he had with the legisla legislative branches. Additionally, compared with Obama and Trump, in 2009, Obama had major majorities, both in the House and Senate. So this is the second thing. Not only is it the general state of America playing a role, but the advantage or size of the advantage in the legislative branch for the president. In, Obama, in Obama's case, uh, these were very large majorities, almost a supermajority in the Senate. It, at one point, it was 59 to 41 in favor of Democrats with the defection of uh, Arlen Specter, a Pennsylvania senator who uh, switched sides from a Republican to Democrat in early 2009. So it almost gave him a supermajority. So he had a lot of more, he had a, a lot more leeway to kind of push through uh, his agenda in the first 100 days. Now, although Donald Trump had uh, majorities in both the House and the Senate, these were much smaller majorities. In the Senate, it was 51 to 49. Uh, and the Senate played you know, the pivotal role in turning down that uh, repeal and eventual replacement of Obamacare in those early years uh, of the Trump administration. So all in all, I would say that uh, yeah, it, it, it actually does play a little bit of a role, the first 100 day does, in the trajectory of uh, a new administration and the, the, the whole duration of the administration. And finally, what we have is a sort of a honeymoon period. It's, it's called a honeymoon period uh, in, in U.S. politics for a president. Usually the first 100 days, typically speaking, is the point in time when a president enjoys the highest approval rating. Not always the case but most of the time. For example, in Obama's case, 70% of approval rating amongst the general public when he was inaugurated, by the end of the 100 days, it was at 63%. A drop, but nevertheless, one of the highest approval ratings uh, in modern history for a president. Compare that with Trump, never was there a time, uh, at least in the real clear politics aggregate of polling, was Trump ever above 50% for his entire presidency for four years. He went into office on inauguration at 45% approval and ended at 42. So with relation to approval rating in the honeymoon phase for a president, uh, that may also play a role as well. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think that the, and maybe I do agree with, with Tomasz Felagy in a way, that the first 100 days is overblown, but it is also important. Well, that's very political scientist-y of you. It depends, right? Depends on a number of different factors, so that's always uh, great to hear. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the key themes that, that sort of inter interwoven between all your um, interventions was that 100 days gives an opportunity to really signal. And one of the signalings, that one of the major signalings of, of um, the Biden administration announced in the campaign and then done is return to the Paris climate change deal. And I think that's sort of a, a momentous occasion, at least if you um, 
think of it in its long term effect and you're less interested in geoengineering and other components of how to combat uh, climate change and climate um, uh, volatility. But I'd like to ask uh, Mate to sort of give us a good sense of how momentous was that? Is this binding, non-binding? What can we expect as we go forward? And what other components, if you had the chance to look at, because there were a number of um, deal, green deal or green ink um, components of the proposed um, almost six trillion dollar um, budgets, although obviously the Republican side did point out that in their estimate, only 9% of the infrastructure plan was actually devoted to infrastructure, which is back to the question of um, are they even speaking the same language? But sort of so, so climate, it, it carries through it. How do you assess that, Mate? The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation, and it's truly an honor to speak here among you. Uh, for forward, uh, someone next door is playing the pi piano right now. <laughs> I'm really sorry for that. Maybe I will have a background uh, music, uh, but I hope you still hear me properly. As you mentioned, uh, the new president promised uh, the country to join the Paris Climate Agreement. But uh, but uh, what is the agreement is all about? Uh, uh, it has the goal that the average global temperature of the Earth will uh, not rise above one and a half degree to uh, 2100. Uh, and the Paris Climate Agreement is currently the most important global pact uh, on climate uh, change, even if it has no coercive force. Uh, the US had joined the agreement under the Obama era. Uh, and uh, as it known, President Trump led the country out of the convention because in his first session, his global agreement was incompatible with the so-called American interest. Uh, with the election of Joe Biden, the US uh, did a 180 degree turn. Uh, and uh, not just in the communication, but in the policies as well. Uh, one of Biden's first order was that a report must be complied uh, about the national security aspect of uh, climate change. Biden established a national climate task force, a uh, new working group that includes uh, cabinet level uh, leaders from 21 federal agencies uh, and uh, senior White House officials. According to Biden's ambitious plans, uh, the electricity production of the US will be carbon neutral uh, by 2035. And by 2050, the country's whole economy will be carbon neutral. Uh, but what is the ultimate goal of this green policy? To save the planet uh, or to keep uh, the support of the green voters? Well. Of course, these are important for the president of the United States, but I believe that the most important thing is that uh, with the green economic transformation, uh, Biden will have the opportunity to build a new economy and make the United States world leader in a new green sector. Decarbonization commitments, creation of a green uh, economy are also a composition to innovate. We need to find solutions to problems we have never solved before. Uh, if the United States can provide green innovation solutions uh, and uh, compete with China and Europe, uh, decarbonization commitments can serve as a catalyst for uh, America in a fundamentally economic and global political competition. Uh, this is a huge opportunity to build a, a new green economy and be a world leader in it. So, of course, President Biden communicated, as he did yesterday in his speech in Congress, that with the promotion of sustainability, uh, they will create millions of new jobs, and it seems feasible. Uh, as expected, the new president will regulate first with the emission of transport and green, green consumption, uh, uh, sorry, energy consumption. Uh, these regulations are uh, the following. Uh, I try to uh, summarize it briefly. Uh, First, uh, Biden prescribed to double the capacity of wind turbines by 2030, set the goal uh, to cut the cost of the solar energy by 60% over the next decade. And uh, his American jobs plan calls for funding for the development of advanced nuclear reactors and uh, incentivize more efficient use of the USS uh, existing fleet of reactors. It's very important uh, from the Hungarian uh, Respect. Um, the second uh, is that Biden also planned to spend $2,000 billion 
uh, to infra infrastructure, as it mentioned before, uh, and a huge part of it uh, uh, is for green development. The plan is to gain the efficiency, uh, energy efficiency is more than 4 million uh, real estates, and he announced uh, that uh, construction of one and a half million new energy efficient residential buildings. Um, President Biden would like to make uh, public transport more sustainable as well, uh, support the manufacturing of the electric vehicles, uh, and set up 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations across the country. Uh, he will replace the US car fleet with electric cars as well. And he promised that incentivized to consumers to buy the electric vehicles. And uh, honestly, it is really necessary because only 2% of cars sold annually in the US are fully electric. Probably uh, at the same time, Biden prohibits the issuance of new oil and gas, uh, gas licenses in federal uh, lands. It is very important uh, in itself because according to calculations, these extractions are responsible for 20% of carbon dioxide emissions of the country. Some experts already are arguing at the same time that this prohibition would be counterproductive because so far only half of the drilling permits issued between 2014 and 2019 have been used, uh, meaning there are plenty of drilling permits in force where work has not yet begun. Uh, and uh, if work starts in these areas, it will certainly increase the total volume uh, in the same way. And fourthly, let uh, not forget either the conserved biodiversity. The United States will preserve 30% uh, of federal natural lands and waters in recent forms. Uh, this can seen uh, as a kind of continuation uh, of uh, Trump's policy on conserving natural areas. See the Great American Outdoors Act. Uh, last but not least, Biden organized a virtual climate summit on the uh, on the Earth Day on April to pressure on uh, the ambition of the biggest uh, polluters. Uh, leader of uh, 35 countries such as Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, Emmanuel Macron, and so on, participated and uh, expressed their commitment uh, to tackling climate uh, uh, climate change. Uh, the U.S. will reduce its carbon emission by 50% uh, by 2030 compared to the 2005 levels, far more ambitious than the aim previously set by Barack Obama. Um, and uh, uh, as it uh, was mentioned before, the event was successful uh, um, because uh, um, it, it was kind of a diplomatic victory because the countries uh, represented by the participants together are responsible for the 80% uh, of the global emission. And yet, following the US, a number of other countries have made serious commitments, such as Canada, Japan, or China. So that's all for now about Biden's first step uh, in, in a brief uh, summary. Thank you, Mate. Yes. And um, first question to Dwight, but then we'll go on to Tamash Barani specifically about alliances and how much US leadership means in this situation. But first, um, Dwight, so we, you, you spoke a lot about the, the three large spending plans, or I think large yeah. doesn't even begin to get it. That's that's humongous in the way I look at it. And I'm as you said, it's a starting position. We'll see how much um, Congress cuts back on it. I, I would have sort of a dual linked question for you on that. On the one hand, we know that um, Biden has, I'm sorry, the Democrats have a majority in the House and a very slight majority, 50-50, with the um, deciding vote by Kamala Harris as the president of the Senate in the, the Senate over there. How much do you think um, Biden needs to rely on any sort of bipartisanship to push through these agendas, specifically when it comes to trade? Some of the things he mentioned last night and over the past 100 days continues the Buy American idea of um, specifically in the spending plans. He outlined the key component of the Buy American, Build American, Build Back Better, but Build Back Better American, if I can add that adjective over there. So how do you think that will impact trade sort of in the larger sense and the domestic constraints on that? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, trade is an issue that uh, 
you, you, you'd have strange bedfellows sometimes. Um, and I, I do think with, and I was going to make that point at, at the beginning when I was ta talking before, is that, you know, um, it, with these big spending bills and, and, and all of this and these, this very aggressive legislative uh, agenda, um, you almost get the impression that they feel like there's a window that they can get this all done in. And, and that, um, you know, the, the, they risk, though, I think, um, uh, they, do, they have a thin mandate, right? I mean, it's, it, it seems like with what they're doing that it's much bigger than it is, um, as you pointed out. Um, so I think like, yeah, on trade specifically, I, I'm not sure that there's necessarily a um, domestic broad um, uh, push for, for, for um, uh, different trade policies. I do think though that, and this gets into, and I'm cheating a little bit, here because I like foreign policy, but um, this gets into, uh, yeah, I think there is broad support across party lines uh, that, you know, China, we have to do something about China. Um, and when I say we, the U.S. has to do something about China and their unfair trading practices. Um, I, you know, I don't think there's going to be a broad settlement um, with China specifically. I think as was mentioned previously, um, that, uh, you know, we're going to work through the WTO because we want to, World Trade Organization, because we want to, like the climate accords, um, we want to work through these large multinational or organizations. And Biden's already said, you know, we're going to work with our, our, our foreign friends and, and allies um, to put pressure on, on China, specifically um, on trade issues. Um, I would note, and I wanted to point out that, uh, you know, I think it was Tomasz Pelegi, and I hope I got that last name right, mentioned something about human rights and being more connected to activist foreign policy. It's interesting in the 2021 trade agenda that was published recently, this is a quote, the Biden administration will also make it a top priority to address the widespread human rights abuses of the Chinese government's forced labor program that targets the Uyghurs and other ethnic religious minorities. And you know, in the, in that autonomous region and elsewhere in the world, so it almost or uh, elsewhere in the country. Sorry, um, it almost seems as if through the trade, and I thought it was interesting. Tomash uh, brought brought that up through the trade, some of the trade stuff, and this is peppered in a lot of this trade stuff, is that they're going to use it as a more activist uh, policy tool um, than the, certainly than, than Trump did. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's, they're going to use it in a different way. And you, you'll notice the, well, maybe he didn't, but the United States trade representative, um, is a China expert. She worked in the, in Congress, um, uh, and, and she speaks Mandarin. Um, so I think there's going to be a real focus on, on that. And I, I think that there, there's broad support for something like that. Yeah. And I think that sort of segues directly into, um, my question to Tomasz Baroni on specifically on the China angle, I think this is something that we've heard connects everything, right? The U.S. is as the reigning hegemon's greatest competitor is China, whether it's trade, um, whether it's energy, whether it's security, all these different angles. The the issue that, that I would draw attention to is perhaps on um, climate change, for example, the question becomes how can you cooperate over there, right, between the U.S. and China, what, what Mate brought up. But I, I had for your quote for you, um, specifically from President Biden's speech last night when he said, in my discussion with President Xi, I told him we welcome the competition. We're not looking for conflict. Um, interesting quote, specifically on the welcoming the competition, because somewhere, right, um, the United States hegemonic issue is to co-opt China, contain China, what to do with China. And obviously the question over here becomes, what do you do with allies who are reluctant to go along with your way? Potentially um, a state which prefers some foreign policy options to keep some foreign policy options open. So inflections points between Budapest and Washington, great power competition, China, future, solve it, two minutes. <laughs> <You're up. laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, and uh, what I have is the first 100 days. Uh, that's uh, not more than Oracle Bones, uh, but uh, let's try it. I think uh, in uh, there is uh, everything involved in the China question, uh, from from democracy to 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 alliances. Um, I think there is this three 
three things here, this democracy promotion and human rights, uh, but also strengthening alliances and also support for multilateralism. And I think those three uh, play against each other in uh, in many ways, like, you know, commitment for multilateralism in the GCPOA runs counter to traditional Middle Eastern uh, US allies, for instance. Uh, and uh, this is uh, also part of the China issue. So uh, there was this earlier question about uh, uh, you know, conflating the democracy issue with the China issue. Uh, I would also broaden the picture here. So uh, the democracy issue is involved in the China issue, but also in the Russia issue. So uh, this is this creates a common ground in you know squaring off against both Moscow and Beijing. But uh, we've also seen uh, in instances and signs uh, when these two are you know drifting uh, closer to each other and this is something uh, i think uh, that must be avoided from from both the us and uh, and, and the european perspective um, so i think uh, the the risk in, in using this democracy promotion lens is that uh, it makes adversaries uh, more willing to cooperate while it makes uh, makes allies less willing to cooperate because let's face it uh, China in itself poses a geopolitical threat to the United, United, United States in the in, in East Asia, East Asia, and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's uh, you know, a pretty sensible geopolitical threat, but it's not as sensible here in the middle of Europe. But um, also, this is very important from many countries' uh, economic perspectives. Like, you know, the biggest trading partner uh, of Germany uh, is China. Uh, though this is not, uh, you know, very common uh, in, in Europe already, but, but theirs is China. Uh, and I think uh, for the Americans uh, to reinvigorate the transatlantic alliance, which I think would be a very good thing, uh, they should use like more carrots than sticks uh, also because uh, in the past few few years when there was transactionalism uh, as a general rule uh, in transatlantic relations, uh, it doesn't just stop from one day to another only because there is a there is a new political will in Washington. So uh, I think uh, even though they are committed to this multilateral framework, uh, there should be some more uh, you know transactional uh, politics in order to to get those uh, alliances together again and uh, and to work again and just one last thing uh, connected to this uh, i think one noticeable absence uh, was uh, again transatlantic trade so we have very serious pending issues uh, from last year from 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 the years uh, of the trump administration uh, that were not settled and not actually addressed in any way. Uh, so I think this is something uh, that needs to be involved in, you know, strengthening alliances. Uh, and so not only, you know, using this rhetoric that is that is suited for 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 the geopolitical competition in the Indo-Pacific is not working uh, for Europe. That's, that's extremely interesting, and you sort of broadened the the competition not just between China and the United States, but you brought in Russia and Europe as well. And if we go down a level, and this is a question to Tomáš Felegi, then uh, we get to regions, right? And one of the regions we focus on, or um, Hungary focuses on multiple times, is Central Europe. And through the Trump administration, there were numerous, initi numerous initiatives um, promoting U.S. Central Europe um, relationship, however that may be defined. What do you think, Tomas? What's the role in central? What's the role of Central Europe as we go forward in the Biden administration? Same level of interest, less level of interest. Well, um, let me pick up those pieces where where Tomas and White uh, left, uh, and uh, let me let me make a distinction between uh, high level economic relations and business relations. Uh, as for the economic relations, uh, certainly a critical issue for Hungary and East Central Europe as such is all those geopolitical uh, turns, uh, decisions and developments that uh, will uh, put basically the framework of overall cooperation between European countries, the European Union and the United States. 
what is going to happen to uh, to all those open issues like energy security, North Stream 2, uh, and in this setup, uh, Russian-German-US relations, these all will influence what Eastern Europe, Central Europe can uh, can put together politically. So that's that's one dimension. The other dimension is, is certainly uh, everyday business relationship, uh, which is uh, to a large extent uh, independent uh, of uh, of all those geopolitical issues and uh, and debates and competition, whatever. Uh, here we are talking about very important. Uh, incentives and initiatives by uh, in 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 Hungary and in Central Europe by governments in the United States by states, not the federal government, like uh, local incentives, uh, all those tax um, uh, support or uh, or uh, or providing any government or uh, state subsidies in the United States for all those businesses that are uh, developing um, workplaces there, job creation and all those things. Uh, and the same applies to, uh, to to Central Europe. Here it is more strongly related to, um, to to government initiatives than in the United States, certainly because of the difference in nature of uh, of, uh, of running the economies in, in these countries. Uh, as for Hungary, I think initiatives vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, initiatives like we we launched uh, under uh, Ambassador Sabo uh, the Business Promotion and Development Campus in the United States. It's a great initiative and it may help a lot uh, Hungarian businesses uh, getting into the United States, entering the US market. And uh, for Hungarian businesses, entering the market is not that difficult anymore. Staying on the market is much more difficult. Because you know that's one thing to enter the market. Then you have to make sure that you are successful enough to survive competition. What you have in the United States, it's a different market than uh, even within the European Union. So uh, that's that's a whole set of uh, of private initiatives that we have to encourage as governments, uh, either in uh, at state level in the U.S. or governmental level in, in East Central Europe. And of course, uh, both from a political and the business uh, point of view, uh, the single Central European markets are not big enough, not strong enough, not challenging enough to be covered by, by US investors. What is small in the United States may be even huge in Central Europe, or at least big in Central Europe. Uh, so uh, the more we can, provide a, uh, a kind of uh, uh, multi-country uh, opportunity to, biz to, to U.S. investors, U.S. businesses, the more successful uh, the, at least the V4 countries, as we traditionally make this distinction, the V4 countries uh, may be. And uh, for this, we, we need to have some kind of a cooperation, both at, at private level and at governmental level as well. So uh, it, it's up to us, I would say, uh, for us, for, for all of Central Europe, the limit is the sky because, uh, because of the size of the US economy, the, the nature of US investment and investors coming into Europe, uh, you know, we cannot be big enough uh, for them, even if we put together several countries. Well, that's a very interesting take on it. I do like the, the limit is the sky. The sky is the limit for Central Europe. Those are very positive words. Um, let's see how this develops. As we're nearing our, our, our time limit, and as I look outside and the sun is out, and so many of you have stayed with us, um, instead of delaying, we're delaying your Fritzer's or Spritzer drinking on the terraces, which are finally open in Budapest. I will have two quick questions to uh, Mate and Ryan, but I would like to ask Judith, I'm um, a program associate here to open up the chat box. And if you have any questions for any of the panelists while we discuss this last two issues with Mate and Ryan, feel free to post them in the chat and we will see whether we can delay our rather nice looking evening any further by making sure we answer all your questions. So uh, if you did opens the chat, my question to 
math is sort of a comparison between um, the Biden administration's plans in climate change and combating climate change and green deals and that sort of aspect of it. How would that compare to the current Budapest thinking on it? Are there similarities, dissimilarities, areas of cooperation, areas of um, noticeable absences, if I can look back over there? So the floor is yours, Matthew. Thank you. Um, well, the goals are the same. Uh, we have uh, decarbonized our economy and uh, the technology uh, we share is the same. Uh, so th these are the similarities, but we have uh, um, some uh, uh, um, different aspect uh, and uh, some specific uh, aspects um, in the US. Uh, let me lighten the internal and geopolitical aspect uh, first, and uh, we will understand that. First of all, in communication, Biden, of course, does not support fossil fuels and the stuff behind Biden envisioned green growth, uh, the development of green energy industry uh, uh, based on renewables, uh, nuclear and strict environmental regulations. And these are uh, more or less the same in Europe. Um, uh, but uh, the former president, uh, Donald Trump, trusted traditional energy sources and has uh, always voiced that. It would be easy, of course, to beat the dust on Trump, uh, as the Democrats often does today. But uh, let's face it, there were realistic social policy priorities behind Trump's energy policy. Not everything can be explained by serving the fossil uh, energy lobby. Uh, today, few uh, remember that the reopening of the mines played a major role in Trump's uh, 2016 election victory. Uh, it also shows that the issue of choosing energy sources uh, is by no means just an energy policy and environmental issue in the US, but also a thick partisan and electoral uh, policies. Uh, this may uh, signal the limits of the Biden administration's uh, ambitious environmental and energy plans. Biden can't uh, be completely uh, confronted uh, with a society that still finds clean energy sources expensive today and still works mostly in traditional industries, albeit in a declining scale, of course. Millions of American workers are currently working in the oil and gas sector. Although much less than before, it is still large enough to deal with uh, in the event of an energy policy revolution. Uh, it's no coincidence uh, that while the administration is advocating for clean energy, Biden has promised to support residen uh, residential uh, communities living next to coal, oil, and gas fields. Um, the foreign policy of the Biden administration is uh, closely linked to energy and climate policy as well. Biden's foreign policy with China is uh, another area uh, where we can expect continuity between the Trump and Biden administrations. A superpower like the United States um, simply cannot allow uh, its rivals to strengthen. The United States and China are the world's two leading consumers of energy. China and I accounted for uh, approximately 22% uh, of uh, world energy consumption and the United States about 16%. Their carbon dioxide emissions uh, account for an even larger share of the total uh, global total. Uh, China alone nearly 29% and the United States 18%. Together, it's almost half of the world's emission. So China, the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases right now, should obviously be Washington's natural partner in the effort of tackling climate change. Uh, so I mentioned uh, the issue of climate change is one focus point of the US foreign policy, uh, but maintaining world leadership uh, is at least as important. Here, though, uh, Biden's antagonistic stance toward the country is likely to prove a significant impediment. Uh, okay, well, thank to, you. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. That was a uh, extremely interesting train of thought, which I thought sort of wrapped up. And as we're quickly um, progressing to the end of our time here, I want to make sure we get to um, Ryan's um, research area focusing on U.S. Hungarian defense relations, something that is always a, a good thing, right? It connects to trade, connects to business. Um, and if we listen to Anthony Blinken, um, US uh, Secretary of State multiple visits to NATO in the past couple of days. The idea of NATO going green also links into it. 
So, Brian, just a quick question, and then um, just as an FYI for, for panelists and for our guests here uh, this evening, we'll be doing one round of, of questions, and then I think we will thank everyone for their time and, um, and interest over here. So just if you have any other questions, please post them while we discuss U.S.-Hungarian defense cooperation and where it can go next, the billion-dollar NASEMS deal on uh, NATO, Ukraine, Afghanistan troop withdrawal, Hungarian aspects on that. What do you think? Where are we now and where are we going, Ryan? Sure. Well, let's let's tackle the U.S. Uh, and Hungary defense cooperation. The cooperation between those countries uh, militarily is, I believe, the strongest element of the bilateral lateral relationship between the two countries at this point in time. Um, if you look back in history, the relationship went beyond or even farther than uh, the accession into NATO by Hungary in 1999. We had the Warsaw Initiative Funds, we had the Partnership for Peace Program, and then we also had an added element to it uh, that was really special between the U.S. and Hungary, which was the Ohio National Guard Partnership. Uh, that began in 1993. So this was years before uh, Hungary's accession into NATO in 1999. And the relationship since then uh, has, has increased even further. You look at uh, cooperation militarily on peacekeeping missions, Iraq and Afghanistan, that is also further cooperation. And then now recently with the Zrinyi 2026 program, uh, that couldn't come at a better time. And I think in many policy analysts in the United States welcome NATO members uh, putting out concrete plans like Hungary has with uh, Zrinyi 2026 of not only modernizing or not only getting their uh, defense expenditures up to the 2% agreed level at the Wales summit, uh, in 2014, but also this modernization program, phasing out old technology, incorporating new technology. Uh, the Defense Cooperation Act in 2019 was, I think, a positive step in defense cooperation. And then, as you mentioned, the NASAMS and the AMRAM uh, missile defense system, uh, which was a big billion dollar contract sign. So I see the relationship and the cooperation going even further. And we can also touch into the extended uh, military exercises over the, the course of the years. We now have U.S. and Hungarian special ops forces doing regular exercises together. These are all positive steps. Um, so again, in summation, I, I think the, the cooperation is going to continue to get better in the future. Uh, and there's you know, certain elements and windows that we can uh, open to go even further. Now, as far as NATO is concerned, um, and the withdrawal of Afghanistan by U.S. and NATO forces in September. Uh, that was, I believe, as predicted. Um, as uh, Tomas mentioned earlier in the discussion at the beginning, that American public opinion on foreign wars, particularly in Afghanistan, uh, is very unfavorable. They, they, uh, the public opinion is, is not for it anymore and hasn't been for a long time. And one of the main platforms of, of Biden's uh, campaign in 2020 was essentially to end the forever wars. But this, this process really started under the Trump administration. Uh, if you know, the, Bi or the Trump administration, the Afghan government, as well as the Taliban, had been in negotiation to figure out a way where we can essentially phase out the troop presence in Afghanistan. Uh, and originally it was set for May 1st, uh, but now it got pushed to September. So. The, the mission, as we had come to know it, I think is, is officially going to end in September and will allow NATO to kind of recommit itself to its near abroad areas in the south and the Mediterranean and especially uh, in the east when it comes to uh, Russia and the issues with, with, with Ukraine, which we have seen over the last few weeks have, have escalated. You know, we had uh, reports, numerous reports, where there was upwards of 100,000 troops assembling near the, the borders of the Donbass and Crimea. Um, but we also have to understand the, the Russian motive of this. Number one, Russia wants uh, Ukraine not to become a member of NATO. That's their ultimate goal, to try and deny any instance or any possibility of Ukraine becoming a NATO member uh, and further destabilizing uh, the border region, as well as trying to destabilize the internal situation in Ukraine, which is already fraught with issues, uh, that's uh, only going to further put the possibility 
of accession of Ukraine into NATO into doubt. So um, as far as invasion is concerned, it's highly unlikely. I think uh, Russia is doing what it can to just destabilize Ukraine as it is. Uh, but this is something that NATO needs to focus on. Primarily for the Biden administration, they've mentioned that they want to uh, recommit American leadership into NATO. Um, I fully support it. However, there are instances and, and elements of uh, uh, Biden's agenda that could may pit certain NATO allies against each other. For example, this idea in the fall of 2020 and then was reiterated shortly after he took office of setting up a summit for democracy. Uh, in order to determine what is officially a rule of law and, and liberal democracy and that sort of things. And that may pit some NATO members against each other, which could run counterproductive to further strengthening NATO cohesion. So um, ultimately, I think the goal or the message of strengthening American leadership, reasserting American leadership into the NATO alliance uh, is a welcome sign. But Throwing instances like rule of law or, or having a, some type of summit for democracy may actually uh, derail their their will for progress, if that's the case. Right. So that is the how do you de-conflict or disaggregate the China challenge from the democracy challenge, specifically when you go through the political military alliance of NATO and the uh, tools over there. Yeah, very interesting question, which we could talk on and on about. but. I'd like to um, ask the panel the three questions we have over here, and then after those responses, we'll have to end as we're very nearing our 6 p.m. Um, time. The first first comment is is extremely interesting. Um, I just broad picture of it is uh, Senate confirmations that are needed for presidential nomination. So obviously, the National Security Advisor is not a position that you need Senate confirmation for, but lots of positions require Senate confirmation, and we get into how much sway the Senate has in affecting a administration's priorities and setting up. So I think over here, the question, if I understand it correctly, and I think Dwight, this um, should be to you, is broadly speaking, cabinet picks, cabinet um, level decisions on how to do this. And I think I will answer the question of what reasonable new time interval should be used to assess a new administration's directions and early results. The answer to that is pretty simple. The midterm election is coming up in 2022, and that's how the system is designed. So that just that just goes on. So um, Dwight, you'll get that question. Uh, Mate, you'll get the question of, the, I think, the Great Ethiopian um, Reconstruction Dam and climate change questions um, going into spilling over to Egypt, Ethiopia, and the Nile. And anyone willing to tackle the Biden-Orban relationship developing? <laughs> Okay, so let's start with Dwight and then Mate, and then we'll, as 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 co co co, co organizers with Tomasz Baroni, I think we'll tackle the last one. All right, well, thank you for the questions, and then let's go through this round, and then um, go for our well earned evening rest. Okay, um, yeah, I, I was reading the question, and and I'm not going to really get into sort of the politics of this, but I do think that um, you know Biden's been pretty successful, especially at the cabinet level. I think there's. Uh, you know, there's, he's had trouble with a couple of them. Uh, one's probably going to get in, one they withdrew, and they're looking for uh, uh, Office of Management and Budget. Um, they're looking for a new new person. But I think this gets back to what you mentioned earlier, Balaj, about this not being able to talk to each other um, across the aisle. Is The reason it's taking longer now than it was 20, 30 years ago is because we just don't see eye to eye. We don't look for compromise oftentimes. And I think that's, that's absolutely reflected in um, in the cabinet. I also would mention too that there are a lot of political appointees in the United States um, in, in the executive branch, more than any other government in the, in the world, frankly, um, at least democratically elected government in the world. Um, uh, but but in, so when I was working at the State Department, you know, the mid-level people, that, that political appointee system went further and further down and it was gutted out because there just wasn't time to get to a lot of these political appointees because the Senate, you know, they have other things to do too. Um, so I think you do see even beyond cabinet level and, and you know, upper echelons, uh, you're seeing a lot of people, a lot of positions just left left empty quite frankly, and that, that harms policy making going forward. Yeah. 
and here's a technological error on my end. Uh, leaving positions open, definitely not a, not a good way of trying to get your um, policy through. So we'll see how that goes. I think, um, Matt, a short reaction to climate change spilling over into conflicts across Northern Africa? Um, this is a foreign policy issue rather than a climate change issue as far as I can tell. Uh, uh, the Biden administration pursues a much more active foreign policy than Trump did. And I believe uh, uh, more and more studies are being pub published uh, on the subject that such conflicts uh, may occur in the future, but I am not an expert on international conflicts, to be honest. That, okay, so uh, <laughs> I think we, we've reached the, the end of our session and probably the, the question a lot of um, people would love to avoid answering, but I think, Tomasz Baroni, you'll take a first crack at it and then I'll close up and close our event as well. Okay, maybe I uh, I also provide like like one extra sentence for the previous question, uh, because I uh, I think uh, it's interesting here that uh, the Biden administration stopped the freezing of uh, of development aid to Ethiopia, uh, and also there was a soaring of relations uh, to a certain extent with uh, with Egypt, uh, not at the executive level but more like at the con congressional level, and so uh, I think. Um, you know, balancing those interests uh, is harder than before. However, uh, I don't think uh, this region is pretty high on the agenda and, uh, you know, Africa-related issues uh, are among uh, the conspicuous absences, or how did you put it? So so that's, uh, that was naturally uh, high on the agenda and I don't expect to, to, to come forward, uh, but obviously those are very, you know, serious and ardent questions to solve. Uh, regarding the, the third questions that uh, about uh, the personal relations between uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Uh, I think that, uh, again, uh, a very interesting dynamic here. There was a, there was a, a um, you know, sort of, you know, emergence of tensions uh, during the campaign period uh, of the US elections. Uh, and it is uh, expected in some corners that Biden administrations are very committed to their, to their ideological uh, positions. However, I would rather put to, I would rather point to the other pledge that's uh, that's the pledge to pragmatism, uh, and also their pledge to be as anti-Trump as possible. Uh, and I think because of the Trump administration was so often described as you know um, overwhelmed with with personal polit politics or the personification of politics, I think uh, the Biden administration as a whole and President Biden as such is really trying to avoid uh, to involve personal uh, sentiments uh, in their politics. Uh, of course, uh, pragmatism is also uh, you know a special feature of Hungarian uh, foreign policy, but uh, there is a very central idea here that uh, whether the United States Hungary relations uh, is, is usually determined by the United States because the United States is much bigger and much more powerful uh, player in the international arena. So uh, it is not really a matter of how we, um, uh, so what are our attitudes more, more like theirs. And I think uh, the, this personal uh, politics is pretty far uh, from the original agenda, or this is at least how I see. So the short answer is yes, I think uh, there there wouldn't be a problem that uh, uh, so there would there, there would be a new a new chance, a new beginning uh, in in personal as well as political relations because I don't think the two are are, are bound together at this point. Thank you. Um, interesting thoughts, and I think the the last question we have added uh, from San Francisco, any ideas about the timing of the appointment of the US ambassador to Hungary sort of links in with the answer to this question. I, I don't have any ideas. I, I think the Biden administration does not yet have any ideas. There are other uh, ambassadorial positions to fill, but uh, building off of what Tomas said, perhaps when the ambassador gets appointed, then we can tell how the biden Orban relationship really begins to develop. But with that, I think it's really time for us to conclude. It is um, a minute to six o'clock, so we've been really on schedule, so excellent. So all that's left for me to do is um, sort of in summation say, myth, 100 days, useful myth, depends on how presidents fill it. 
it's good for us to talk about. It's good for us to look at. Certainly um, easier than to wait two years until the midterms to see any results. I want to thank all our panelists for coming and for um, their excellent contributions and, and comments over here and thank all our guests um, together in the name of the Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the American Studies Research Institute for contributing to a very interesting panel discussion on the myth of the 100 days. So Dwight, Tomasz, Tomasz, Mate, Ryan, thank you all. And uh, Judith Sakos, thank you so much for all your help, who was um, incremental in aiding us through, uh, through organizing all the technological events over here. So with that, thank you all for coming. Have a great afternoon and see you all at our next event. See you. Bye.